Good morning. I'm Father Tom Malionic. I'm the rector of St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Kinderlook, New York. Today is Sunday, May 31st. It is the day of Pentecost. It's the 50th day after Easter, the end of the Easter season and the beginning of the season of the Holy Spirit. Today we celebrate the day on which the Holy Spirit was sent to the disciples as they were gathered in an upper room, waiting to be clothed with the power from on high. We're going to be praying this morning the Office of Morning Prayer from the Book of Common Prayer of the Episcopal Church. And since this is our Sunday worship, even though uh, we cannot be together to celebrate Mass, we're going to be using the lectionary for the Holy Eucharist for Sunday, rather than the lectionary, uh, the texts that are assigned for morning prayer. So I would like to invite you at this time to minimize, if you could, uh, any external distractions, the cell phone, television, whatever. If there are others with you, either online or in person, and you would like to invite them to join us for our prayers, by all means, they're more than welcome to do that. If you don't have a Book of Common Prayer, it's perfectly fine just to listen. There are also some links in the description section or the, the text header to this video that will connect you with some resources and the order of service so that you can follow along if you would like. But it is also entirely fine if you just want to listen. Um, I would also like to ask if you would please that um, you join me in a brief prayer asking God to ensure that the technology will work properly and I will be able to operate her properly, that the evil one will be pre prevented from interfering with our, our desire and our intention to be in union with God and in communion with one another. Father in heaven, we ask you, Lord, for the intervention of your Holy Spirit. I ask you, Lord, that you would send your holy angels to defend us in battle, to keep at bay the forces of the evil one, of the enemy, who are trying to ruin our prayers. We ask you, Lord, to keep us safe, to defend us, so that we may praise God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. And one final thing before we start, let's just take a moment, if we could, and just ask God to act as well on those inner distractions that are, we can't always find the, uh, the volume control to turn them down. So we'll ask God to, to calm the thoughts in our minds, to set at peace the feelings in our hearts, and to give peace to the restlessness of our bodies. You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to set forth his praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation. And so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him, let us compose ourselves in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all our sins, all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. O Lord, open our lips. 
and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. On page 83, Christ our Passover. Alleluia. Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Alleluia. Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Alleluia. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Alleluia. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 104, verses 25 through 37, which are found beginning on page 736 of the Book of Common Prayer. We will read responsively by a whole verse. O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the great and wide sea with its living things, too many to number, creatures both great and small. There move the ships, and there's that Leviathan, which you have made for the sport of it. All of them look to you to give them their food in due season. You give it to them, they gather it. You open your hand, and they are filled with good things. You hide your face, and they are terrified. You take away their breath, and they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, and they are created, and so you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in all his works. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God while I have my being. May these words of mine please him. I will rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed out of the earth and the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Alleluia. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When the day of Pentecost arrived, the disciples were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared. A reading from the Holy Gospel. A reading from the, a reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When the day of Pentecost arrived, the disciples were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them, and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were, dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, 
Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Word of the Lord. On page 85 in the Book of Common Prayer, Canticle 8, The Song of Moses. I will sing to the Lord, for he is lofty and uplifted, the horse and its rider as he hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my refuge. The Lord has become my Savior. This is my God, and I will praise him, the God of my people, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a mighty warrior. Yahweh is his name. Chariots of Pharaoh and his army has he hurled into the sea. The finest of those who bear armor have been drowned in the Red Sea. Fathomless deep has overwhelmed them. They sank into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in might. Your right hand, O Lord, has overthrown the enemy. Who can be compared with you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, awesome in renown, and worker of wonders? You stretched forth your right hand, the earth swallowed them up. With your constant love you led the people you redeemed. With your might you brought them in safety to your holy dwelling. You will bring them in and plant them on the mount of your possession. The resting place you have made for yourself, O Lord, the sanctuary, O Lord, that your hand has established. The Lord shall reign for ever and ever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. I want you to understand that no one, speaking in the Spirit of God, ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. 
To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given, through the Spirit, the utterance of wisdom, and to another, the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all of the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. The Word of the Lord. On page 92 in the Book of Common Prayer, Canticle 16, the Song of Zechariah. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant, David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father, Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. On the evening of the day on which Jesus rose, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. The Gospel of the Lord. On page 96 in the Book of Common Prayer, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Page 98, the Suffrages, Form B. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy, for we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope, and we shall never hope in vain. O God, who on this day taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending them the light of your Holy Spirit, grant us by the same Spirit to have a right judgment in all things and evermore to rejoice in his holy comfort. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the same Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. O God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessings through the worship of you, that the week to come may be spent in your favor. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Prayer for Mission at the top of page 101. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross, that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit, that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you, for the honor of your name. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Come, Holy Spirit. For the Holy Church of God, that it may be united, filled with truth and love, and found without fault at the day of Christ's coming, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit. For all patriarchs, bishops, and other ministers, and for all the holy people of God, we pray, come, Holy Spirit, for this congregation, that it may show forth the glory of God in all that we do, we pray, come, Holy Spirit, for deliverance and liberation of all who are beset by evil and malicious spirits, we pray, come, Holy Spirit, for the mission of the church, that in faithful witness we may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit, for those who do not yet believe, and for those who have lost their faith, that they may receive the light of the gospel, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit for an outpouring of all your gifts, that we may bear the fruits of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit. For those in positions of public trust in every nation, and for those who endow them with authority, that under their leadership, all may work together to promote goodwill, justice, and peace, wisdom, civility, and righteousness, forbearance and reconciliation, and dedication to the common good, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit. 
for the desire and commitment to cultivate gracious ways of seeing, hearing, and understanding, we pray, come, Holy Spirit, for our hearts to be inclined and our wills to be directed towards graciousness and self-expression in public, in private, and in social media, we pray, come, Holy Spirit, for our enemies and those who wish us harm, for all whom we have injured or offended, and for the grace to amend our lives, we pray, come, Holy Spirit, for a blessing upon all human labor, and for the right use of the riches of creation, we pray, come, Holy Spirit. For all who are prevented or discouraged from working, we pray, come, Holy Spirit. For gratitude and generosity among those who have enough, we pray, come, Holy Spirit. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, for refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger, for all who are affected by violence, especially in Oklahoma and Minnesota, and for victims of domestic violence, that all of these may find relief and safety, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit. For all who have commended themselves to our prayers, and for our families, friends, and neighbors who suffer in body, mind, emotion, spirit, or circumstances, especially Lynn, Rose, Rick, Teresa, Oakley, Stark, Lisa and her family, Brian, Dave, Brendan, Glenn, Tom, John, Pam, Jay, and for the residents and staff of the Grand at Barnwell, the Fireman's Home of Hudson, the Pine Haven Nursing Home, and the Rosewood Nursing Home, we pray, come Holy Spirit, for an end to the spread of infection and contagion, we pray, come Holy Spirit, for protection and support for doctors, first responders, and all others who provide or facilitate the care of the sick and the dying, we pray, come, Holy Spirit, for the encouragement, support, adequate resources, and success of all involved in find means of prevention treatment, and cure, we pray, come, Holy Spirit, for all who suffer from isolation, whether emotionally, socially, and financially, we pray, come, Holy Spirit, for all who suffer from addictions, and for all who love and care for them, we pray, come, Holy Spirit, for all who celebrate milestones today or in the coming week, especially Blue Anderson, Julie Riquette, Michael Ribka, Lisa Morgan Klepeis, Debbie Kosky, Frank and Carol Curran, and Father Carl Griswold Kuhn, we pray, come Holy Spirit. For all who have died, especially Anunzio, Lodzero, Brian Maguro, Fred Bissell, John Williams Sr., and all who have died in connection with COVID-19, and for those who mourn and grieve for them, we pray, come Holy Spirit. In thanksgiving, for the life of Dan Kelly, for the new home of Nee, Chloe, and Seth, 
for our brothers and sisters in Christ, for all who spread the gospel in our community by deepening faith and life in Christ in others, and for our benefactors who sustain the mission and vocation of our parish, our diocese, and of Christ, one holy Catholic and apostolic church, rejoicing in the fellowship of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, St. Paul, St. Benedict, St. Justin, the martyrs of Lyons, the martyrs of Uganda, St. Boniface, and all the saints, we commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ, our God, as we pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit of God, you have poured your love into our hearts and granted us a diversity of gifts for the building up of your Holy Church. Come to us now in power and stir up those gifts among your faithful people at St. Paul's Church and in the Diocese of Albany, that we may, without shame, fear, or fatigue, announce to those around us the good news of your coming kingdom, and in our common life bear winsome witness to the same that the world may know that you are making all things new and that we are your disciples. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Father, ever one God. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I was all set to talk to you this morning about how Pentecost is ecstasy. Not the drug, but in the ordinary meaning of ecstasy. Of standing outside, of being outside the normal, outside the ordinary, outside the everyday. Of being extraordinary, of being in a different and unaccustomed and unusual place of having shifted position. And you've heard me talk about this before. You've heard me talk about the fact that the, the word holy, that the root meaning of that word means set apart, special, different from the rest, different from the ordinary, different from the, the everyday. It is Pentecost. It is the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. That is what makes us holy and set apart. This coming of the Holy Spirit on us is what makes us holy because the presence of the Holy Spirit within us and among us makes us different from those who have not received him. So I was all set to talk to you this morning about how ecstasy also has that connotation of being suddenly transported almost like an out-of-body experience of being in a place from which we see things from a completely different and new and, and unfamiliar and exciting, captivating perspective. And this is, in fact, a, a precisely the reason why we, we talk about ecstatic experiences, why drugs give us that experience of ecstasy, because they make us see things differently. It is as if we really were someplace different at another vantage point. Things look new. Things look unaccustomed, unusual. We see things we didn't see before, even though they were all, always, always there. And then there's that whole dimension of joy. Because when things do look new and different, oftentimes 
we discover something delightful that we had missed. There's something delightful about that experience of seeing something upside down, turned over. Think of all those pictures the, of frowning faces and you turn them the other way around and there's a big, a big bright smile. But the thing about ecstasy and the thing about Pentecost and the thing about the Holy Spirit is that, that we are so caught up in the experience at the time that we don't think about the fact that we're having the experience. C.S. Lewis talked about this when he talked about joy as being what you realize you had when you no longer have it. Because while you are in that, that state of joy, that state of ecstasy, that different place, you're too captivated. Your attention is too focused on what it is you are seeing, what it is you're perceiving, than to be self-consciously thinking to yourself, now I am seeing something, now I'm having an experience. That's not the way joy is. Joy takes us outside of ourselves. The Holy Spirit takes us outside of ourselves. This is why we associate joy with childhood. Because in childhood, for, for children, things are almost always new and fresh and different. They're always finding some new perspective. Because there's always something new they're encountering. They don't have much else to compare it to. You know, we keep seeing things from other perspectives. Even if, it, even if it's something as simple as, as someone picking us up and, and putting it on our shoulders, we delight in that. It's exciting. It's fun. We have a new vantage point. And in addition to the joy that we have in those new perceptions, that joy also brings us love because we can't get that vantage point for ourselves. We don't even know it's there to be had. If we even knew that it existed, we couldn't get there on ourselves. Somebody has to pick us up, put us on their shoulders. Someone else must do this for us. And it is the coming of that someone else who does it that is the source not only of the joy, but of the love. And children crave this. They love, they love surprises. They love what is fresh and new in the world. There is a, a, a quotation I, I failed to find the source of, uh, and it's, it's lost way back in the, the mists of memory, but it was something like this. It was a psychologist or a psychiatrist, I believe, writing about the observation. An observation. Um, he, he observed two, two small children, two little girls, and it was one little girl. And Dad snuck in the room behind the younger child and grabbed her and picked her up and tossed her in the air and whirled her around, twirled her around the room, holding her hands. And she laughed and she giggled and she just it was utter delight. And she loved her daddy for doing that. Because he did it unexpectedly. He did it without being asked. He did it just because, not because she had earned it, not because she was a good little girl, but because he wanted to come in and delight his child. And so he picks her up and twirls her around. And on another occasion, the whoever it was, the, the, the observer, noted the dad come in and try to do the same thing with the older child. But the older child didn't want that anymore. She didn't enjoy it. It wasn't fun. And then the key line in all of that is this one, wrote the author, this one was no longer a child. And I think that's part of why Jesus says it's so important for us to be like little children, that we, we have to have that attitude of not enjoying being in a rut. We have to have that attitude of liking and expecting surprises and loving the person who gives us those surprises, who allows those surprises to come to us, the experience of surprise. And that's part of what, what is so heady and exciting about getting to know God, those early days of being a Christian when the fireworks are going off in your, in your mind and in your heart and your spirit and your everything is new and fresh and wow god is awesome and great and wonderful in those early days god comes and sneaks up on us and without warning 
grabs us and, and changes our whole life, twists us around, tosses us up in the air, lets us see new and different things we could never get to, to see uh, on our own. God interrupts our lives for something that is worth losing ourselves in in the moment. And God keeps offering us those experiences time after time. But here's the thing. What makes those experiences, whether it's a child uh, being surprised by a parent, or whether it's God surprising us with, with some new perspective or new insight or, or new area of growth or new discovery, what, what makes that joyful for us, what makes that a delight, what makes the ecstasy a positive experience is that it is combined with the solid conviction that the other person means us no harm. That even, even, and even then, even if some disastrous accident should ensue, if some, for some reason dad's hands had slipped and the little girl had gone hurtling across the room into a corner, the relationship was one, was such that that could be overcome. If that solid conviction is there, the relationship is not changed or destroyed, even if, even if terrible things should happen. It's that attitude of mutual surrender and abandonment to, to each other's care. That remains. The trust remains. The faith remains. And the problem for us is that as we grow older and as we, as we cease to be children, we start to reverse the order. We start to insist that trust, that faith be earned without really realizing that that, of course, destroys the very idea, the very definition of faith. If it is proven, it is no longer faith. It becomes then merely a commodity, merely a contract. It becomes no more reliable and enduring than any other treasure, no more permanent or dependable than money or pleasure or security or health or strength or power. Rust corrodes, moths nibble, thieves steal, people disappoint. So that, that, that trust that is given that results in that joy, that's a matter of faith, not of acquired belief, not of acquired conviction, conviction, not of a reasoned conclusion from evidence. It is a pre-existing attitude that endows those experiences with delight. Well, anyway, I was all set to tell you about ecstasy and joy and delight and the coming of the Holy Spirit who twirls us around the room as we laugh with delight and faith and all of that. And I was all set to tell you that this is what the apostles discovered. That not only the world, but they themselves were different. That, that they had done nothing themselves. But all of a sudden, as Jesus predicted, the power came to them from on high. They didn't know when it was going to come. They didn't know what it would be like when that came. It just happened. And the thing is that it did nothing actually to the world. The world did not objectively change, but it turned them inside out. And it turned them out of where they were and out into the streets to talk to anybody who would listen. And then they discovered that in fact, there are a lot of people out there who have ears to hear. Now we can think of the Holy Spirit as some kind of cosmic force, you know, like in Star Wars, and we can think that it's just some kind of strange and, and metaphysical energy that happens to have, in our setting, a Christian name. And, and you know, there have been attempts down through history to try to, to put some kind of a persona, some kind of a, a form or a shape on the Holy Spirit. Um, there's one of, the, one of the better ones, I think, actually, is the, uh, the, the, the creative intense, um, joyful person um, portrayed in the, in the shack. Uh, if you've seen that movie or if you've read that book. Um, even, that doesn't, even that doesn't quite do it, but 
that image has some good points to it, I think. But the Holy Spirit is a person because the Holy Spirit does relate to us just as another person relates to us, just as God the Father and God the Son relate to us. The Holy Spirit relates to us primarily by giving gifts, giving that gift, that gift of transformed perspective, giving the gift of new discovery, of freshness, of newness, of life that has not gone stale, of life that has not gotten into a rut. And the Holy Spirit gives us these gifts freely. We don't earn them. We don't deserve them by being good. We're not entitled to them. We may be heinous sinners, and the Holy Spirit might still give us some gift. Where we go wrong with this, I think, is that we think of the gifts of the Holy Spirit as, as being kind of like superpowers given to us so that we can do dramatic and extraordinary things that will either... Um, overcome people's objections to God, or that will bring uh, unexpected and impossible good into the world. And sometimes that does happen. But if we get hung up on the supernatural phenomena, we miss the real gift of grace, which is the fact that they are given gratia, grace, freely. They are free gifts, and they are given to us freely so that we may turn around and give them away for free. Mom and dad in church when you're little giving you a quarter so you can put it in the collection plate. That's a gift given to us, not so that we can keep it, but so that we can give it away to others. Anyway, I was all ready to talk to you about ecstasy and the Holy Spirit and holiness and superpowers and joy and gifts. And then this week happened. In society appears to be unraveling, the economy is precarious at best, people are in each other's throats over public health and safety measures, over policies, over government, over politics, the usual stuff, but somehow it seems even more bitter and divisive. And it seems a little bit less like Pentecost than a scene out of the opening chapters of the book of Job. Instead of delight, we have anxiety. We have terror. Instead of blessing, we have curse. Instead of bearable challenges, we have impossible, impossible uh, difficulties to overcome. And it almost seems flippant and, and disrespectful in the in the wake of the tragedies of the past week to talk about joy and goodness and ecstasy. You don't need me to spell all of this out for you, but I think that there is still a way that we not only can connect with the joy, but that we must. If we are going to continue to be followers of Jesus Christ, if this parish is to continue to be a missionary outpost of the Diocese of Albany, if we are going to continue to have an existence as a Christian community, as a body, we must be infused with these gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the one gift of the Holy Spirit that is really comes close to being a superpower is the one that Jesus talks about in the gospel today, the gift of being able to forgive. Forgiveness is not rational. Forgiveness is not reasonable. For all that we have those wonderful arguments about how we should forgive because at least it's good for us, if not for the, the person that we're forgiving, there's some benefit in that. That's not the thrust of it. The benefit of, of forgiveness is that it is God speaking into the world through our mouths. It is God loving the world through our hearts. It is God looking at the world through our minds changed so that they become the mind of God. And when the world sees that God is looking at it, even in its sinfulness, just as we were once looked at in our sinfulness by a loving God who said, you're still worth it. You're still worth saving. You're still worth incorporating into my plan. You're still worth being part of the story. You have a part to play. You have a role to play. And I'll give you the tools to play it with. When the world starts to see and hear that, the gift goes on. It keeps getting passed forward. If we take the approach of looking at the problems of the world and start 
tackling them without falling back into ourselves, without falling back into the arms of God, without letting God pick us up and show us that other vantage point, without becoming convinced in and of ourselves, without becoming converted to the viewpoint that it is precisely the relationship with God that matters most. It is precisely our surrender into the arms of that loving and delightful and playful God. If we don't make that our first priority, if that is not our deepest, most fundamental bedrock attitude, then all we will ever wind up doing is arguing with each other over which side of the issue Jesus is on. We will start to to take the scriptures and use them as if they were simple hammers and wrenches in a toolbox. Instead of instruments, not for the changing of the world, but for the changing of ourselves. Not, not so that we can apply them to the problems of the world, but so that they, applied to us, turn us into not, not workmen, not craftsmen, but God's own artisans, God's agents, able to walk into fraught and tense and conflicted, polarized situations and look at the person who has a very different idea about what should be done and why and say still, but nothing will ever get us to the point of dividing us. Nothing will ever get us to the point of hating one another. Nothing will ever get us to the point of blaming one another for, for the problems of the world. None of us will ever get to the point of bad-mouthing each other. Because the Holy Spirit of God gives us that different perspective, lifts us up, raises us up, and yes, spins us around so that we don't remember and we don't know which end is up and it doesn't matter because the eyes we're gazing into are the eyes of God. We realize that the only eyes worth gazing into are God's eyes, then we can look into the eyes of another and see not an enemy, not an opponent, not an evil person trying to take away our health or our constitutional rights or our civil liberties or our dignity as a person, but still to see another human being, sinner just as much as us, loved by God just as much as we are. Then we can start to get somewhere. But we have to keep coming back to that bedrock. We have to keep coming back there. Otherwise, the problems will own us. And we will not be God's agents, but puppets of the the circumstances of our world and the sins that abound in everyone, including in us ourselves. So, brothers and sisters, this is the day on which we open ourselves to the coming of the Holy Spirit who is going to change our perspective. This is, this is our opportunity to welcome a revision of our values and our priorities and our choices and our convictions. not to all of a sudden necessarily flip and change our minds about the practical things of life, but to change our minds about what matters beneath those problems and beneath those issues. That's a tremendous gift that has been given to us. That ability to go out into the world and say, forgiven. Your sins have been taken away. The sins you don't even know you have have been taken away. The sins you refuse to admit that you have. Jesus Christ has done that for you, and the Holy Spirit is here to make sure you know it. That for all the evil that you or I have done, or have contemplated doing, or have not resisted the thought of doing, or have toyed with doing, all of that is and can be forgiven. And it is our great privilege and our great gift to be able to proclaim that to the world. 
happy Pentecost. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On page 101, the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace, and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies, that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our, petition, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come life everlasting. Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, thank you for joining us in prayer this morning. I have a few announcements for you. Um, parish directories are available. Uh, and they're available for free by email. Just uh, let us know how to send one to you. They're available only to parishioners, um, but they are available uh, for free to parishioners by email, and uh, they're available in hard copy as well, again, only to parishioners, uh, at a cost of $16. So if you'd like one, you can call the office or leave a message or send an email to stpaulskinderhook at gmail.com, and uh, we'll make sure that you get one. Uh, the question has keeps coming up of uh, reopening churches, and there has been a lot of news and a lot of talk this past week about reopening churches. And there is, um, I think, some confusion. There is a difference between the state saying churches can reopen and the church's uh, own authorities saying that the churches can reopen. Uh, Bishop Love and the Standing Committee of the Diocese are close to finalizing canonical guidelines for the reopening of the churches, but they have not yet been completed or, or issued. The bishop did this weekend give an ad hoc dispensation to those parishes that had already made uh, extensive plans for Pentecost celebrations, but they were still subject to uh, some fairly strict requirements. In our case, um, I can't see us really needing or wanting to go forward um, if we can't really open our doors to anyone who wants to be there. Um, it is, it is sad that we cannot celebrate the Eucharist together, certainly, and it's uh, a little bit of a, um, an inconvenience and a strain to have to relate to one another and interact, interact to one another through telecommunications rather than in person. And, and hopefully the time will come before too long when we can do that again. But by the same token, we also want to be respectful of the health and safety of anyone who comes to our doors. Um, and so when a date is announced, our own opening date will not necessarily be the, the, the minimum specified. We're going to make sure that we comply not only with the letter of the law, uh, but that we comply generously with its spirit. And so that, so that, that anyone who comes will know, not just by our, our compliant behavior, but by our very attitude, um, that we do, in fact, have genuine and heartfelt care for the well-being of all. That's going to be that's going to be our principal uh, our principal criterion for for when and, and how we open. To that end, I have asked the vestry, and I, I would also urge all of you um, to start building the common ground that we need in harkening back to Pentecost, harkening back to the sermon. Um, to start building common ground based in something other than science, based in something other than politics.
politics and government, uh, but based instead in a shared commitment to God and a shared appreciation, gratitude, reliance, love, and joy in what God is doing with us, even in the midst of our worst tragedies and crises. Start building that common ground so that when we start having the practical discussions, we will not simply fall into that into that 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 pattern of arguing over which side Jesus is on. I sent in the epistle this week uh, a number of links to a number of articles. I have asked the vestry to read them before we start any discussions uh, about policies, procedures, and whatever and dates for reopening. Uh, and I, I recommend them uh, strongly to all of us so that when we talk to one another, again, uh, we do not immediately start uh, formulating or entertaining suggestions or advocating positions, but that instead we always start from that, that basic bedrock foundational acknowledgement, and I think explicit acknowledgement, that the whole purpose of reopening is precisely so that we can be the missionary outpost that we are called to be, so that we can fulfill our vocation to be a place of people who gather to worship God, to become better disciples, and to make disciples of the nations. That has to be the base. That's the basis for our reopening. Really, it's for us to come with that shared attitude. Um, if you have some difficulty accessing those writings, then just feel free. You know, contact me, leave a message in the comments, or send an email or something, and I will make sure that that um, you get a hard copy if you need that. And then um, finally, I would just urge everyone, please, to to be in touch with one another to. Um, to share these announcements and the ones in the epistle with those who may not have seen them, uh, to continue to exercise and show care for one another, to continue to be kind and gentle, to continue to be um, mild and sensitive to one another and to each other as people rather than as, uh, again, rather than as, as exponents of the position. So I, I, I ask that God would grant you peace and health and joy today. I will be back, God willing, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock with uh, morning prayer, live stream. I hope I will get eventually get this whole system figured out. I thought I had it. And it didn't work this morning. But thank you for your patience. And I will be now working to get this uh, video edited and up onto Facebook and YouTube. I, I ask your prayers, uh, desperate need of your prayers. Uh, with all that's going on, and I have the technology added to that. So I, uh, I ask your prayers and promise that I will be praying for you as well. God bless you.